how does the increase in the rate of population will occur it is because of the reproduction capability of the particular organism eventually what happens in such a situation the superior competitive species will survive and the inferior competitive species eventually might become extinct so that might happen if it has to complete its life cycle the parasite needs a vector Hello everyone a warm welcome to another session on chapter 13 of second pc that is organisms and population i am dr divya biology faculty vidyashram pre university college mysore temple of excellence so in the previous session of this chapter we had discussed about predation wherein in predation which is a kind of population interaction one organism if it is benefited the other is not benefited and also we learnt about various strategies the plants and animals follow in order to avoid being prey to a predator in today's session we shall discuss about one more coexistence mechanism in population interaction that is competition so when it comes to competition here both the organisms are not benefited in nature so we shall begin with the session so competition so competition occurs when two closely related species they compete for the same resource say for example in a grassland they compete for feeding on the grass so the resource there is grass so all the herbivores living in that particular grassland they compete for the grass so what happens when so here two species are competing one is grass is one species say for example the deer so here the grass is competing with the deer for its survival the deer is competing with the grass for its survival so here the deer sometimes what happens because of this competition sometimes both the organisms are not benefited why the deer will continuously start feeding on the grass therefore the grass population will entirely come down and finally the deer will not have any grass to feed on right so that is what happens eventually in competition so competition occurs when two closely related species compete for the same resource that are limiting but sometimes competition is not completely true here also some organisms in order to survive they have changed the strategy for competition uh, that is they might have changed their foraging or eating habit and all that all that we'll discuss in the coming slides so totally unrelated species could also compete for the same resource so that is also true here it no it need not occur between the species of the same category but it also can occur between two completely different species best example that we can take of here in some of the shallow lakes of south america and flamingos they usually feed on the oysters the fishes and the zoo planktons that are there in the lake so here they are, these two are completely different species flamingos they belong to the bird family right the, that is the aves whereas the uh, zoo planktons the other kinds of uh, aquatic forms that are there they are also completely different species oyster they are completely different species so here the competition is occurring between two different species entirely different species that is between the flamingos not just the flamingos so flamingos they feed on they'll feed on the fishes they'll feed on the oysters they'll feed on the zoo planktons everything that is there in the lake and in turn the fishes that are there also will feed on the zoo planktons and all that that are there in the lake so between entirely different species the competition is occurring here so this is one best example that we can consider to understand competition means it is not just between the two related species but it is also between two entirely different species so here we understood that we had learned in the definition for competition that competition occurs between two related species on the same limiting resource but that is also not true to some extent because competition can occur between two entirely different species and not on the limiting resource but sometimes if the resource is abundant also then also the competition can occur so here competition to be considered between two similar species or two unrelated species the resources need not be limiting for competition to occur and here 
the feeding efficiency of one species might be reduced that also might lead to competition due to the interfering and inhibitory presence of other species so that is why so here sometimes the resources might be large but there might be some species which are feeding on the uh, resources very less and some species which are feeding on the resources too much so that is why in spite of the resources being unlimited also the competition between the unrelated species can occur because of the differences in the feeding habit and even if the resources are abundant also or be it the food the space so do you think that elephant is quite huge and the deer is quite small isn't there a competition between them of course there is a competition between them to feed on the plants right so that is why competition need not necessarily between the two same related species and it need not necessarily be only when limited resources is available. So competition can occur between two unlimited species as well as competition can occur when the resources are quite abundant. So this is about competition. So overall we can understand competition as competition can occur between two related species as well as two unrelated species for either a limited resource or also for a resource that is found in abundance. So that is about competition. So competition therefore is best defined as a process in which the fitness of species that is measured in terms of its R value which is the intrinsic rate. So the intrinsic rate of increase in the population. So we had studied about this in the previous session, right? So how to measure the intrinsic rate of increase in the of the organisms in the population? How does the increase in the rate of population will occur? It is because of the reproduction capability of the particular organism. And we all know that those organisms which are capable of surviving and reproducing are considered to be fit. So therefore, competition is best defined as a process in which the fitness of one species is significantly lower in the presence of another species. So here competition can be considered mainly based on fitness. So here one species might be less fit to survive in the habitat whereas the other species might be more fit to survive in the habitat. So therefore Competition is defined as a process in which the fitness of one species is significantly lower in the presence of an another species. The best example that we can take here is of the Abingdon tortoise of Galapagos Island. So if you remember about Galapagos Island, Darwin had visited Galapagos Island, right, wherein he had studied about the golden finches. Likewise here in the Galapagos Island, there once lived the Ebingdon tortoise. So this Ebingdon tortoise actually became extinct within a decade after goats were introduced. So this is the Ebingdon tortoise that used to live in the Galapagos Island. So when goats were introduced into the islands and we all know that goats are voracious feeders, right? They keep munching on the grass. They will never stop. How much ever grass is available for them, they'll keep munching on it. So what happened eventually because of the uh, goats feeding on the grasses and the plants and all that, therefore the availability of the resources completely got reduced in the Galapagos Island. And therefore the these tortoise, they didn't have food because of the goats. There was a competition between the goats as well as the Tortoise. So when goats were introduced, what happens? Due to greater browsing efficiency of the goats or the grazing efficiency of the goats, the complete grass and the plant population came down. Therefore, the, this particular tortoise did not have get enough food and that eventually led to the extinction. So these tortoise are no longer found in the Galapagos Island because of an organism that was introduced there. That is one of the main reasons why here that is what happened and not just that tortoises they can lay a large number of eggs and a large number of um, offsprings will come out of it and now they also should be fed right from where will they get the resource so that is why reproduction also plays a very important role in competition here so now the reproduction capacity of goats are less but of the tortoise is quite more now can we consider that 
goat is less fit than the tortoise no now here the tortoise because of its extreme reproductive capacity it was not able to for the population enough resource was not being available because of that particular reason so that is why they became completely extinct so this was about the best example to define a competition wherein the fitness of a species is considered so in competition we shall study about competitive release so a species whose distribution is restricted to a small geographical area because of the presence of a competitively superior species is found to expand its distributional range dramatically when the competing species is experimentally remote so here talking about competitive release a species so any one of the species who is distributed in a particular geographical area or it is endemic to that particular geographical area along with that there is a superior species also living there so because the other species living there is superior it is hindering the expansion of this particular uh, species which is less fit to live there so in such cases what can we do the competition should be released how can the competition be released by experimentally removing that particular species from that particular area and putting it somewhere else why because that species say for example we have species a and species b species a is less competitive whereas species b is superiorly competitive so species b will start growing very fast not providing any enough space for species a for its expansion so what scientists can do is they can remove species b from that particular area and grow it somewhere else where there is no competition for it so that can be done so that is called as competitive release so the best example that we can take of is cornell field experiment so a field experiment was conducted by cornell wherein what he did was on the rocky sea coast of scotland there is presence of a species which is called as barnacle balanus so this barnacle uh, balanus is a highly competitive species and it competes over or it dominates over the smaller barnacle that is smaller species which is the barnacle ketha malus so ketha malus was not able to expand properly or not able to grow properly because competitive species that is barnacle balanus used to overgrow on them and not provide enough species for the smaller barnacle ketha malus to grow competitively superior barnacle balanus and put it into some other region so therefore competitive species is not there the less competitive species could properly grow in that particular region so we have the diagram here that is the image that is put of the barnacle balanus which is superior uh, species you can see there how fast they spreads without any spaces they completely cover the rocky coast and leaving no place for the less competitive species that is barnacle catamalus to grow there properly so here competitive release is done that is removing the superior barnacle balanus which is of superiorly competitive removing that particular species from the environment and shifting it to a area where this particular smaller barnacles are not growing there so that is how the competitive release was done and the best example that we can take of is cornell's field experiment so next talking about one more principle which is called as gauss competitive exclusion principle so the gauss competitive exclusion principle states that two closely related species which are competing for the same resource cannot coexist indefinitely that is true right previous slide when we are talking about competitive release there the balanus barnacle and the balanus catamus they were both were competing for space that is catamus species were transported to the other regions in the island so that they can grow in a separate space and these uh, balanus barnacles can grow in a separate space but what can be done if the same resources being utilized by an organism we cannot shift them and put somewhere else right so that is what gauss competitive exclusion principle states that the two closely related species wherein both are competing for the same available resource 
in a particular area they cannot coexist separately and the competitively inferior one will be eliminated eventually because both are depending on the same resource so that is why you cannot remove one from that particular area and put it somewhere that is the time when competitive release will not help so this may be true if resources are limiting but not otherwise again here it can be done when the resources is unlimiting where in other regions also the resources is abundantly available then it can be done but if the resource is limiting and both the competitive species are depending on the same resource in that particular area then it is not possible to go in for competitive release so that is what the gauss competitive exclusion principle states so in eventually what happens in such a situation the superior competitive species will survive and the inferior competitive species eventually might become extinct so that might happen so that is why competitive release that is connell's field experiment will always not work so we shall study about one more that is parasitism so we studied about competition today so in competition both the species are not benefited so but in the case of parasitism again here in parasitism one species is benefited the other species is not benefited so if you remember i had told you there is a difference between predation and parasitism parasites they live on the body of their host throughout but predators they just kill their prey feed on it and it's over but parasites they tend to reside on the body of the host deriving the nutrients out of it and eventually killing that particular plant or the animal species in which it is residing so many parasites have evolved to be host specific again here not all parasites can infect all plants or all animals they are again here host specific so if i say for example fusarium solani which is a fungal pathogen can infect all the plants belonging to the solanaceae member such as the tomato the brinjal and all that but other than that it cannot infect the other plants because they are host specific likewise um, there are many parasites which are host specific that is they can parasitize and infect only the host which they are supposed to in such a way that both the host and the parasite tend to co evolve that is if the host evolves special mechanism for rejecting or resisting the parasite the parasite has to evolve mechanism to counteract and neutralize them in order to survive in that particular host successfully so what usually happens in parasitism is say for example a parasite is trying to attack a plant the plant will start to develop some defense mechanism against the parasite now it is the duty of the parasite to evolve in itself so that whatever the chemical the plant produces to keep the parasite from reaching the plant the parasite will start developing or evolving in such a way that whatever chemical might be produced by the plant it can go and infect so that is how so whatever mechanism the host will adopt a counter mechanism to that a parasite has to make if it has to infect that particular plant so if you i don't know whether you have noticed or not we get mosquito repellents right use it continuously in your house after few days you can notice even if the mosquito repellent is on and fumes are coming out of it in spite of that the mosquitoes will be circulating why they would have adapted there mosquitoes are a parasite they would have adapted itself to that particular chemical or any of the mosquito repellent cream as well that is also that the mosquito gets adapted to it so that is how whatever mechanism the host adapts in order to prevent the attack by the parasite the parasite makes a counter mechanism for that so that it can that is attack the host reside in it and derive nutrition from the host eventually killing the host so in order to be successful in order to survive the host should also increase their defense mechanism and in order to survive the parasites also will increase a one more counter mechanism so that it can go and attack the that is host plant so this is what happens in parasitism both try to coexist by undergoing various mechanisms so here let's talk about what are the adaptations that are followed by the 
parasite. So, whatever the chemical compound the plant might produce or any animal might produce in order to prevent the attack by the parasites, the parasites will adapt themselves so that it can go and cling on to the host. So, what are the adaptations by the parasites? We shall see. So, parasites, they have lost their unnecessary sense organs. So, if sense organs are not there, it will be easy for them to go and parasitize on any of the organism or the organisms which they are meant to parasitize on. So, loss of unnecessary sense organs from them and the presence of adhesive organs or suckers. So, these parasites, the best example we can take off is leech. So, if you can see here, they don't have any sense organs and also they have suckers. And in the sucker, there is presence of adhesive that is a sticky fluid so that they can go and cling on to their host and derive the nutrition out of it. So, to cling on to the host and derive nutrition, they have this sucker. So, to cling on to the host and also they don't have a digestive system. So, these parasites, what are the adaptations they have taken? So, the adaptations by them are they don't have any of the unnecessary sense organs and they have suckers and in the suckers adhesive so that they can go and cling on to the host surface and they don't have a digestive system. Why? Because they would have been directly deriving the nutrition from the animal on which they are residing. So, blood, the best example is leech. Leech has taken blood. So, for that digestive system is not needed and not just that we have there is tapeworm and all that. So, tapeworm they feed on the whatever food we are eating that is being digested that will be eaten by the tapeworm. So, there also because they are feeding on the digested food itself, they don't need a digestive mechanism here or a digestive system and they have high reproductive capacity. So, these are the adaptations they follow. One is high reproductive capacity, they don't have a digestive system and they have suckers and adhesives in the sucker to cling on to the host and also they don't have the unnecessary sense organs in them. So, one of the best examples for a parasite we can take off is the leech. So, leeches they have sucker and they don't have all the mentioned things that are there. They do not have them and these are the adaptations they usually tend to follow. So, next talking about some other parasites that is the life cycle of the parasites. So, the life cycle of the parasite is complex. It is quite complex because the parasite undergoes one part of their life cycle occurs in the body of the parasite and the other part of the life cycle occurs in the host whichever the parasite is infecting on. So, that is why it is complex because it involves one or two intermediate hosts of vectors to facilitate parasitization of its primary host. So, not just that if it has to complete its life cycle the parasite needs a vector. So, the one of the best example that we can take off is the human liver fluke. So, the human liver fluke actually, so liver fluke it is a trematode parasite and it depends on two intermediate host. So, here one is a snail and a fish. So, from the human, so how it spreads? So, here it how it completes its life cycle. So, first it will be in the human uh, body that is this particular uh, liver fluke that will be present in the liver of the human body. So, from there it enters into the or it will be present in the intestine of the human body. From there it will come out through the fecus that is the excretory matter. These excretory matter if it is fed by the snails then one part of the life cycle. So, first part of life cycle will be completed in the snail and when the fishes feed on the snail, the other part of the life cycle, the second part will be completed by the fishes and when humans feed on these fishes, the, it will enter back into the human. So, that is how two intermediate hosts are being used. One is the snail and the other one is the fish here. From the humans itself, through the fecal matter, it would have entered into the environment and snail are feeding on the, that is mat, organic matter present on the ground. These liver encounters the fecal matter, if it encounters the human liver fluke, then the liver fluke will enter into the snail. One part of the life cycle will get completed in the snail. Then when the snail are fed by the fishes, 
then it will enter into the fish and the second half of the life cycle gets completed in the fish and when the humans feed on the fish without proper cooking and all that then it will enter back into the human so this is how the life cycle of here there is a intermediate stages here wherein two different organisms are required for the life cycle of this particular parasite human liver fluke to be completed so that is why it is a complex process the life cycle of parasites are quite complex similarly here talking about the mosquitoes so mosquitoes also the ma uh, malarial parasite so this malarial parasite actually needs a vector so vector it's like a carrier vehicle so here the carrier vehicle is the mosquito so the, in the mosquito this malarial parasite will reside in the mosquito it will complete its one half of the life cycle in the mosquito and the spores of the parasite will come to the saliva of the mosquito and the mosquito when it bites the human beings through the saliva spores of this malarial parasite will enter into the humans these spores will germinate in the human body and it will multiply there so second half of the life cycle is in the human body or in the animal body so here that is how they complete their life cycle so the malarial parasites needs a vector that is the uh, female Anopheles mosquito to spread to other hosts. So that is how the life cycle is completed in two stages in two organisms in the case of parasites. So that is why the life cycle of the parasites are quite complicated. So next talking about the parasitism. So how do these parasites, they attack the host or parasiticize on the host. So majority of the parasite, they usually cause harm to the host. What are the effects if a parasite attacks a host? So they reduce the survival of the host, the growth of the host and also the reproduction capability of the host and eventually the host will die and also it will reduce the population density. So therefore these parasites indirectly they reduce the population density if the hosts are not treated well if they are infected by a parasite and they also they render the host more vulnerable to predation by making it physically weak so if the parasite attacks a host the host will get a disease so if the host gets a disease it will become physically weak and if it becomes physically weak it will be attacked by the predators because I told you the tigers or any of the carnivores they don't just attack all the animal those which are not fit to survive they are the ones that get attacked so here the ones which are not fit to survive are the ones which are infected by the parasites and have become physically weak so that is how their population will come to a decline so they are more vulnerable to attack by the predators so these are the different drawbacks that occurs on a host if they are infected by a parasite. So next talking about in parasites there are two types of parasites one is ectoparasites and endoparasites. So ectoparasites means they infect the host outside the body of the host. Endoparasites means they infect the host inside the body of the host. So liver fluke it is an endoparasite. And these malarial parasite also is an endoparasite. But there are various ectoparasites such as the lice on the human. So in a human head, the lice that is there, that is seen. It is It doesn't enter into the body. It is external. It is an ectoparasite. The ticks that are seen on a dog is also ectoparasite because it will be clinging on to the surface of the dog's skin. And also in marine fishes, they are infected with the ectoparasite which is called as copy pods. So copy pods you can see here carefully observe on the outside of the body of the fish you can see the copy pods clinging on to the body of the fish. So they are ectoparasites and one more is cascuta. So cascuta is a parasitic plant it lacks leaves and it lacks chlorophyll to some extent. So that is why it grows abundantly on other plants and derives nutrition from that particular plant eventually killing that particular plant and they are also one best example for ectoparasite. You can see a cucubitaceous member on the cucubitaceous member you can see the cascuta rolling and clinging on to it deriving the nutrition from the plant. So it is one of the ectoparasites. So next talking about endoparasites. So endoparasites they live inside the body of the host and example in the liver in the kidney then in the lungs and also in the red blood cells so if it is a mosquito parasite it will live in the red blood cells 
So we have the common one, there is the liver fluke that is present. Then in the kidney, there are presence of these round worms. And uh, in the lungs, especially in the red blood cells, there is presence of the malarial parasite that is plasmodium. So plasmodium vivax, you can see how they have infected the red blood cells. So they are found inside the body of the organism or the host which they are infecting. So that is why they are called as the endo. Parasites. So next talking about in parasitism, there is one more called as the brood parasitism. So in brood parasitism, we all know about the story of the crow and the cuckoo, right? So cuckoo birds, they are very lazy. What do they do? They always keep singing happily on a branch of a tree. They never build their own nest. They actually wait for the crows to build a nest. And as soon as a crow builds the nest, and it lays its eggs, this cuckoo bird will go there and lay its egg. So that the crow thinking that it is her own egg, along with her eggs, it will also sit on the cuckoo eggs and it will help in the hatching of the cuckoo eggs. Also feeds the cuckoo offspring without knowing about it. So that is called as brood parasitism. So brood parasitism in birds is a quite fascinating or an interesting example of parasitism in which the parasitic bird will lay its eggs in the nest of the host and lets the host incubate them. Building a nest is quite a laborious process, right? So instead of the parasitic bird building the nest, it will lay its egg in some other bird's nest. So that is what it does. So during the course of evolution, so here what happened was because of this process, during the course of the evolution, the parasitic bird's egg started resembling the other bird's eggs as well. So, during the course of evolution, the eggs of the parasitic bird have evolved to represent the host egg in terms of size and color so that it reduces the chances of the host recognizing the parasitic egg. So, the host will not come to know at all. She'll think that it is her own egg. She'll not be uh, able to detect that it is a foreign egg and she will incubate the eggs. The eggs will hatch and eventually the birds that come out also, she will feed that. She will come to know that it is not the offspring. By that time, the bird would have completely been developed. So, this is called as the brood parasitism. It is a quite interesting mechanism by the bird. So, you can see here the different egg here which is laid. So now you can understand the difference here but there are some birds which have evolved in such a way that lay similar eggs to that of their host. So this was about today's session wherein we discuss about the competition and parasitism. So in competition both the organisms or the species will not be benefited whereas in that is a parasitism one organism will be benefited whereas the other will not. So we studied by taking various examples. So I hope you understood the session well. In the coming session, which is the last session of this chapter, we shall study about commensalism. That is one more kind of organism that is population interaction. That is commensalism and mutualism. So we shall meet again in the coming session. Thank you.